Gab with your host, Doran All and me, Daddy Warpig. We are back. Geek Gab for Saturday, September 21st, 2019. And uh, we want to welcome our uh, guest today, uh, Alexander. And, uh, oh, I've already messed it up. What have you messed up, Danny? Uh -oh. It's not my fault. It is that Cortez's guy fault. He's got me <laughs> just oh, just got us confused, crushing my brain. No, uh, we're we're gonna get back on track here. We're gonna get back on track. Uh, Donal, how was your week? Hey, it's been a good week. I uh, went back to work after a long vacation. Work was all right. Uh, gaming was all right. I. Uh, Fortunately, canceled my World of Warcraft subscription, so I'm still playing, but only through the end of the month. So there's light at the end of the tunnel. Okay, now you posted a piece of paper about somebody looking for a group. Uh yeah, that was in a, that was in a private chat. It was, it was the strangest thing ever. But but I just I want to be clear because when you posted it, I I thought that that was somebody. It's been a week for like weird mental reactions to things. I thought that was somebody like handing you a piece of paper begging to be in your D and D group. But that was not the case. That was not the case. It was it was a posted on a the local game store has a board a, a cork board for you know businesses and things, and also for people looking for a group or looking for a service that sort of thing. Most of the time, it's hey, I'm looking for players for a game or. I you know I like to do art in my spare time. I'll draw your character, which I that's that's a whole side topic that really weirds me out. But that's beside the point. And and it was one of those advertisements. Hey, I'm looking to play a game. You know I'm looking for people to play with. I want to play Pathfinder. Only it was this really and I hate to use the phrase this really cringe inducing, <laughs> um, supplicating. This guy, this poor guy, and and and. At the, at the start, I had a lot of sympathy. This poor guy uh, wants uh, players so badly. He's like, hey, I've got a, a nice house in this part of town. You guys can come over. I'll DM, and then we'll switch off. If you want to DM, we'll play. He's and groveling. He's groveling. He's groveling. He's like, oh, and as far as meals go, hey, I like to cook. I'll cook for, for everybody who shows up, right? Um that sort of thing. And, and, and I start, and I keep reading this and I, I have to find this to finish this off correctly. Uh, I keep reading this and I'm like, wow, this, this poor guy, I mean, I've been lonely before. I think we've all been lonely before. You're like, wow, that, that sucks to, to grovel like that. Um, but, and, and Twitter's not letting me find this, uh, this photo here. I know why, because Jeffro spamming the chat. Uh, he he on, finished. Jeffro. He, 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 darn he, Jeffro. Freaking Jeffro. He he finishes off this whole thing after after all this really um, embarrassing sort of groveling for players with, oh, and one last, th and here's the bad news. I'm a middle-aged white male, and I know there's too many of us in the hobby right now. Sorry. <laughs> uh. I don't understand it. Uh, he, uh, he, I found it. Uh, it's brutal. Uh, and all the groveling is, is headed under why I am awesome. Right. Uh, at the last point, uh, the last point is pure millennial speak The why he is awesome. He is totally not an a-hole. Just, just throwing that out there. Uh, but then less awesome. Yes. I am a nearly middle-aged white man and there are way too damn many of us playing dice and paper games. That, Sorry. That then he should just stop playing dice and paper games. Right? One one less guy. One less guy uh, right. doing that. I, that's I mean, what, I mean I, it's I I understand I understand having trouble uh, finding a group, meeting people, that sort of thing. I get it. There's lots of lonely guys in this world. But I why why do you hate yourself so much to to say, "Hey, I'm not awesome because whatever this immutable characteristic of mine you know i'm and apologizing up front for it uh what a loser <laughs> what that, a loser that, yeah that's self-loathing that's what that is right that self-loathing self total self-loathing 
I just that's a heavy burden to bear. I mean, it, yeah. it almost makes you want to invite him to, to join your group just to be like, it's okay, pal. But then, no, actually, not really. I don't, I don't want to. Because well, you know, right? Yeah, you're right. Uh, that was my first instinct. I was like, man, just someone needs to sit down and be like, hey, it's all right. Let's, you know, let's just play. Yeah. But after reading this, I realized, no, there's a, probably a couple of really good reasons why he doesn't have any friends. Could be looking for girls. You never know. I mean, the sympathy. I don't know. I mean, I we, this is the Pacific Northwest uh, in the year of our Lord twenty nineteen. Uh, that that sir, he might he might be one of those, you know, pseudo. Uh, please spare some coochie, ma'am. Uh, <laughs> groveling types. <laughs> Pe- people I mean, who are deep into self loathing also tend to be like emotional manipulators. Yes, very true. Uh, yeah, that. I've I've never been more turned off by uh, a display than this. Th- this that topped all the cringe you can see on Twitter every day. See, the thing is, if he had, if someone had come along when he was young, like you know, slightly preteen or in his teen years, and and put him through something that was difficult that he could do. Uh, he might have been shaken out of whatever it is that put him through that. And he could have turned out to be like a decent guy, you know? Um, if, if he had gone through character development and, and developed something that was excellent, learn how to work hard, learn how to overcome, learn how to push himself, he could have turned out to be a good guy. He could have gotten all that off his shoulders. And, and I'm not saying... He can't do that. He could still go and do that. Um, but, man, it's just it's sad that uh, whatever happened in his life that, that uh, didn't let him do that um, or, you know, whatever was missing in his life that didn't let him do that is kind of sad. Very sad. So... Yeah, that, yeah, that happened to me this week. Um, so this week, what happened to me? Oh, wait, am I supposed to wait for you to say that now? Daddy Warpig, that was my week. How was yours? All right, yeah. Okay, so my week, I had a really weird like, mental reaction, and I'm still not sure what caused it. I think it's because there's too many people with black and white avatars and I just kind of binned a lot of black and white avatars in the same bin in my brain. Um, the same way like Bette Midler um, and Barbara Streisand ended up being binned in the same mental category. Like for a long time, unless I thought about it specifically and concentrated, I would just think they were the same person. Was that been labeled crazy? Um, no, it was just, you know, actor, singer, middle-aged ladies. Gotcha. Um, or like Toby McGuire um, and the Hobbit, Frodo. <laughs> I mean, those two guys, they might as well be the same person, right? Um, sure. So I just bend those two guys together. So, anyways, um, somehow, uh, Alexander AJ Cortez, uh, he, he's the guy who this last week sent out that infamous tweet about how video games make you weak, you are weak willed scum. Deliquescing away in your chair with strings of muscle mass dripping from your nose if you play video games. I I believe the phrase is bottom tier subhuman. Oh, okay. Yeah, I didn't remember that. But but is that worse or better than the top tier subhuman? That's what I couldn't figure out. 
Yeah, are there multiple layers of subhumans? And is it better to be on the top or the bottom? I, I don't know. I don't know. There's 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 many levels to that tweet. It's it's like an onion. So my reaction wasn't so much like being offended because I play video games. My reaction was and literally, this is the absolute truth. I thought I said to myself, wasn't he part of the Pulp Rev? In fact, I went so far as to think to myself, didn't he follow me? Wasn't he one of my followers at some point? And then I click on his account and I see that he's got 100,000 followers. And I'm like... I don't think this guy is the guy I'm thinking this guy is. <laughs> Who is this guy? Why does he look familiar, like so familiar? I would think he followed me at some point. Did he follow me? Have I talked to this guy before? It Literally, it's been confusing me for the last couple of days, trying to remember where I had seen him before and why I thought he was part of the Pulp Rev. No idea until just before the show. Uh, and it's actually our, all our guests' fault, it turns out. I'm not kidding. Yep. We just literally found this out before the show. Uh, I don't know why it's, it is, uh, you know, Providence. It is a uh, crazy coincidence. We found out before the show that it's it's all uh, our guests' fault that, that I am confused. Do you want to tell them why? Well, I think it's because I am also guilty of having a black and white avatar. So that oh, could certainly yeah. be a part of it. But also because I follow this guy and I actually rather like him in general. And I think I might have been retweeting and responding to him. And that kind of got uh, got him on your radar, Daddy. So There's there's um, a little bit of overlap. Pulp, yeah. Pulp, pulp Rev and, and whatever sphere Cortez is in. Exactly, exactly. So I first uh, started following him because I like his fitness advice. It's uh, it's solid. He's got a good mailing list. He gives tons of it away for free. He's got fitness programs you can buy. And I, my interactions with him, I found him to be a solid dude. But he's got some other uh, opinions as far as – so like, like Dornall said, very adjacent in a lot of the cultural realm. But in other realms, he certainly does not think anybody – should ever play a video game ever because you will turn into an immediate soy boy. So hence some of the confusion. Well, let me, let me describe something that happened to me um, this last couple of weeks. Uh, and then we'll jump into talking about your book and stuff. Sure. Um, I played a game called contact. That's the name of the game. And that is the worst name for a video game in the history of the world. If you have a name like Skyrim and you do a search for Skyrim, you pull up a bunch of stuff about Skyrim. If you have a name like Two Worlds, you can do a search for Two Worlds and pull up a bunch of stuff for Two Worlds. It's simple. It's easy. If you have a video game named Contact and you do a Google search for Contact, do you wow. know what you pull up? Do you want to know? Could be anything. 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 A hundred thousand pages of uh, industrial um, supply stores telling you who to call in case you want to buy, you know, 10 ton lots of sheets of plastic, anything in the world. You can stick contact video game in there and you will come up with a whole bunch of stuff that has nothing to do with this game. Worst thing ever. Um, that's off topic, but it's, it's kind of been frustrating me. It's actually almost more frustrating than what I've been going through with the game itself. The game itself is pretty okay playing, except for the bosses. You don't have to defeat these bosses to win the game. But I don't, I don't that's get it. Interesting. They're they're side quest bosses. 
you fight these bosses to beat these side quests. There's some achievements tied to them. And uh, so they're optional, right? Only people who choose to go up against them have to go up against them. There are a couple of bosses who are necessary, but all the bosses in the game are absolutely crushingly, ridiculously difficult. I mean, you'd be playing along with the game and it's getting a little bit harder and it's getting a little bit harder and it's getting a little bit harder. Kind of that nice difficulty curve. You're improving your abilities in the game and the enemies are, are leveling up. And then you'll hit a boss fight and the difficulty uh, curve suddenly becomes this gargantuan wall and you just slam into it. It's painful. You hit the difficulty curve like a car hitting a wall at like 80 miles an hour. Is it is it difficult in the way that makes you actually want to keep trying or just you just want to chuck your controller out the window difficult? I don't know. Uh, I've And here's the thing. I've never done that before because I don't know that I've ever bought a game that does this before. Other than maybe Deus Ex Human Revolution. And that only had a terrible difficulty curve because a completely different company made the boss battles. And so the game was training you on stealth and non-lethal combat the entire game. And then all of a sudden you are fighting a giant cyborg with a minigun who, if you, you know, looked around a pillar at the wrong time would instantly kill you by shredding your skull. It was horrible. So that game had a really cruel difficulty curve that wasn't intended. It was only done because a completely different company who didn't understand the game did those boss battles. That's not the case here. Same company did them, and I don't know why, but like... I died 10 to 15 to 20 times on each boss before I would defeat one. And I, there are people who win boss battles by learning the patterns of the boss and controlling the combat and basically you know, mastering the combat, controlling things. I, I don't think you can do that in this game because the fights are too chaotic. They're too fast-paced. There isn't much of a pattern to learn, at least for me. Maybe other people can do it. And so it's just frenetic combat and... You win by this being the one time where you did everything right again and things happen to go your way this time. So that doesn't sound fun at all. I don't know. All I know is I really, really liked the rest of the game. I think it's a brilliant game with a great background and I've really enjoyed all of the game. And so I wanted to get through the boss battles, so I've just gone back and kept on doing them. Um, I've got two more left that have both killed me ridiculous amounts of time. I still don't know if I can beat them, but I'm going back and I just beat one of the final three last night. I got two more left, and I am just working my tail off to see if I can beat these last two bosses because there's a few more quests after them. And if you can get to those quests, then I'll have finished all the side quests and all the main quests in the game, and I'll be done uh, less any DLC they come out with. I I'm just kind of pee. I'm just kind of irritated at the boss battles. 
I'm I'm angry enough to want to beat them. That's okay. By the time this time next week, you'll have forgotten about them. Right. So, all I'm saying is, um, when he says that, when he says that people don't learn anything playing video games. I have never been, and it started off like a month ago with Alien Isolation. Same thing. You know, you'd go to do something, you'd make a mistake, you'd die. Um, I, uh, I'd never done that sort of thing before. I just, I guess I happened to not run into these kinds of games before. Um, so it has taught me to be more patient, not just with playing games, but also with inanimate objects. To be more patient with my computer that's taking a little bit too long to process, or you know, the phone when it gets hung up over some stupid thing, um, you know, when it's got thread lock and beach ball spinning, things like that. So I think he's wrong. Uh, I think video games can teach you things and if you you can waste a lot of time on video games but video games are not necessarily a waste of time i think that's very well put like with everything you know you, you got to do it in moderation right you're not going to ignore your kids to play a game and uh i don't think most people do plus i'm with you i learned how to plan a city playing video games i learned how to fly a you know fly a stealth fighter and i learned how to uh or at least i learned an awful lot about medieval combat so you know you can't discount those things amen i learned how to cast fireballs see there you go that comes in handy it starts it starts with a flower yeah <laughs> right. all right all right alex i i think we've we've uh we've squeezed that one dry T tell me more about your awesome book. Sure. I'm, uh, so I uh, just came out with this about a couple weeks ago, and the paperback's available now if anybody's interested. But it's called The Last Ancestor. Um, it's sort of my, my homage to uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs, Jack Vance, crossed with maybe a little bit of Thundercats and Masters of the Universe. So uh, it's a sci-fi story about a group of uh, – Religious refugees get chased off of Earth, and only a few of their ships find a habitable planet. It's a planet called Eksak, and uh, they land, and unfortunately, the natives are this kind of canine, ursine race of humanoids that happen to run the country that they land in, and they do not like these foreign interlopers. So there's a war immediately, and then things settle down. The, the humans are able to keep the... Uh, they call, they call the natives growlers. That's their derogatory term for them. They keep them at bay because they have firearms and the growlers have the numbers. So there's an uneasy truce here. But the problem is that too many of the growlers are interested in coming into the human settlement and learning about their faith. So the, the leader, this is all happens as the book starts. So, or I should say before the book starts. So the, uh, the growlers leader, starts another war and that kills our main character's father so the book begins with the main character he's uh he's 16 years old now we flash forward in time and it turns out that his best friend is one of these growlers a young growler boy and um the book is about you know first off their friendship and then they uncover a, a conspiracy or they run headlong into the uh the growlers plans to start another war and wipe the humans out once and for all um they kind of have an uneasy truce where the humans aren't even allowed into the Growler city. They're not even allowed outside of this, you know, 20, 30 mile radius. They're cordoned off or quarantined, you could say. But there's this one priest in the human community who just doesn't listen. And he's trying to, to spread the word. And it causes all sorts of trouble for everybody. So that's what the book's about. Um, it's got, as you can tell, there's... Christian elements in it, but it's not necessarily, uh, I hope it's not preachy. People have been telling me they haven't found it preachy at all. They just found it more interesting than anything. But, uh, you know, it's about how these, this human and alien friend kind of, they try to, you know, 
bridge the gap between their peoples, stop an all-out war, and they have to fight some freaky aliens and giant serpents and lizard men and other nasties as they do it. So it's uh, you know sword and planet with plenty of gunplay. Uh, I hope people like the action. And, you know, it just happened to come out at the time that John De La Rose was coming out with his um, Justified, when Adam Smith with his Deus Volt Wastelanders, and then, uh, you know, Brad Walker kind of kind of kicked it all off with the Star Knight saga with, uh, you know, it just seems a lot of books coming out right now that people have had in the works that are trying to counteract the, the tepid or the, the mocking portrayals of Christianity in fiction. And if you ask me, that's uh, a big part of the pulps that I have been reading in my own foray into this world that started about, I don't know, four or five years ago. And, um, you know, I had a lot of fun writing it. Uh, I got an awesome cover artist. I had Ardenon do the map and some cool concept art that I've been putting on my website. And it's just, um, you know, it's been a blast. People seem to like it. And, you know, anytime you write anything that people seem to like, that's really what it's all about. And it's given me the opportunity to uh, hop on here and talk to you guys. Oh, well, it's it's cool to have you on. You know, we've been we've been talking for a long time now. It's sort of part of the pulp revolution. So uh, yeah, it's absolutely. it's good. It's good to finally have you down. Uh, talk about what you, what you've been doing. The, what what was up with the billboard? Which billboard? The, the billboard. Mm -hmm. Am I the only one who saw that? Somebody made a, a billboard. Oh, yeah. Dan, Dan Wolfgang. I, I don't understand. You have to I fill literally, in. for like 10 seconds, thought that was legit. Nope. I wish it was, but uh, nope. It broke my heart. I thought maybe like Amazon had put up a billboard somewhere and they were just throwing up books or something. That would be something. But no, it. It wasn't real. I think Dan tweeted that. I think Dan made that and tweeted that out. Oh, that's that's cool as heck. Let me uh, let me try and show this. Yeah, it's really cool. I think. Yeah, maybe we need more of that. But you you pointed out that there's a lot of people sort of doing this the same thing. You sort of you downplayed the the Christian element of it but you're right there's there's everybody sort of got the same idea yeah 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 i guess i downplayed it because it's not quite as overt in this story it's not um you know i'm not it's not about like uh like you know john's book i mean he's like it's the crusades in space right oh there you go i made it in photo fun yeah yeah that's the picture that's really cool yeah that's it uh, maybe maybe that's our next step now that now that everybody's sort of uh, there's a all you guys are in sync you know you sort of implemented the same idea at the same time uh let's yeah it's put some billboards up now let's put some billboards up logical next step <laughs> <laughs> well really you only have to put one billboard up and then change the picture every now and then that's true that's true. We'll have to start a uh, start a crowdfunding for a billboard. Can you imagine that? <laughs> Alex is making a billboard. <laughs> uh, uh, that, that's a good idea. I've never advertised on a billboard before. I'm sure, depending on um, location, it's it's pretty costly per month. I mean, Times Square can't be that expensive, can it? No, 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 no. It, it, they do that though, don't they? The the real big authors, like when there's new Stephen King or something like that, they will advertise in very expensive places such as Times Square. And right? I think it. I, I think they all say like the ending is aliens, right? Yeah. Okay. Um. So here's something I'm I'm not clear on because because you, uh, I'm not familiar with your work, but you've sure. been doing a blog for a little while, and yes. and how, and how many books have you written? This is my, <laughs> how many have I written? Probably 12. This is the second I've published. Second um, you've published. Yeah. So this is my second and I'm working on part two um, when I get a chance. Um, I'm not nearly as prolific as some of the other guys. I haven't quite mastered the whole having a day job, having kids and a wife and sleeping and writing, you know, 3000 words every day. I'm, I'm uh, not quite there yet, but uh, this is the second book I've published in less than 12 months. So I'm, I'm, I'm pleased with that. 
Oh yeah, uh, I'm. Uh, I've been following your. I haven't picked up the book yet because, as as you well know, I don't really read. That's fine. Uh, I, I don't read for fun, but uh, I have been following your blog. So I I I like your writing. I like uh, you actually put a little thought Thank into you. it instead of just you know here's random thoughts for the day. Five minutes. All right, my post is done for the day. Go. I try. I mean, I, I, I have some posts where I mail it in, like I did one about coffee and that got literally the most comments of any post I've ever written. I just dashed off something about how I'm a coffee addict and that seemed to be my most popular post. But I appreciate that uh, you think the other ones are more thoughtful. <laughs> uh, yeah, I I definitely, when I read something like that, I, 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 I need some more thoughtfulness out of it. If I, if I wanted junk food out of my blog, I don't know. I'd go find a YouTube, I, I'd go listen to a red letter media podcast or something like that. Right. <laughs> Love those guys. <laughs> yeah, they're great. I, I, I'm not going to lie. I, uh, I made the mistake of listening to them when I was uh, uh, weightlifting one time and it was one of their nerd crew episodes which if anybody's not familiar, that's where they pretend to be your typical internet pop culture vlogger guys. Shield they do media. a parody, it's, and it killed me. I almost dropped the, ben, the bar on myself laughing. It was a very bad idea, incredibly bad idea. <laughs> well, yeah, that's interesting because when whenever I'm uh, exercising or working, I, I, can't listen to, I can't listen to something that I have to pay attention to. I don't like feedback in, in my brain. I, I it's got to be purely instrumental, purely background music. That's, even even when I'm exercising. That's funny because my problem is, is if I listen to this is why I can't. I have trouble listening to music at work because I end up paying attention to the music more, or it's a little easier for me to to listen to a a show. It's funny how we're completely flip flop like that. Oh yeah, yeah. I I can't background a show I, either. If it's getting most of my attention or or uh, I might as well just be listening to music. Well, it's for the better because you don't want to be laughing when you're lifting weights. Trust me, it's very bad, <laughs> very bad, very dangerous. <laughs> yeah, just, just just like when Daddy Warpig's talking, I just sort of sort of tune out and then and then come back a few minutes later. <laughs> oh, that's that was mean. That wasn't fair. Oh, you weren't on mute. Oh, oh no. You know that doesn't even bother me. <laughs> you, you'd have to pick on Mr. Flyer to get a reaction out of that. Uh, I'm, Mr. Flyer. A, I'm the war pig, baby. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Um, yep. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to talk about that guy. I mean, I really feel sorry for him, but at the same time, once you get to be so many years old, you kind of have to take control of your own life and start to do things yourself. Find oh, yeah, something yeah. you're good at. Yeah. I mean, seriously, if you if you don't like your life, if you are don't like yourself, if you're filled with self-loathing, the very first thing you need to do is stop doing things that make you feel bad about yourself and start start trying to find something that uh, that you're good at. Confidence comes from success, and you need to start looking for something that you're good at because that'll build your confidence. Uh, also, go back to church. That's just my advice. Yeah, that, that's, that's, uh, that's good advice. I mean, and it's funny that you're saying this because one of my big – one of my big pet peeves is self-loathing is when people hate themselves. If, like, and like you're saying for no good reason. And it's like, well, you got to Nothing complaining about. It, it's not going to do anything. And you're not going to get sympathy from sympathy from other people by just complaining about it. You have to go do something. I mean, maybe this guy actually really is a good DM or whatever, who knows, but you're not going to get, you're not going to attract people to, to want to hang out with you. If you put up a flyer like that, you know, a woe is me mopey, I'm I'm really terrible, but I'd really like to hang out with you, type of thing. It's just not going to happen. Yeah, it's not going to happen, and it's sad. It it makes me more sad. You know, you chuckle at it, but it makes me more sad than anything else, to tell you the truth. Yeah, that's why I didn't I didn't blast it all over the internet. Yeah. I I I kept it to our our little corner because uh, we talk about gaming a lot as well. And uh, man, that's if I'm not. I wouldn't be surprised if 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 people who are are more less empathetic than I am have got taken a hold of this and, and, and really laughed at it. I had a good laugh. It's sad. Yeah, it is. It is sad. And that's, you know, 
going to just make things worse for, for that guy. You know, co- contrast that with some other jokers you see on the internet who try to do stuff like that. And, uh, you know, at least this guy didn't blast it all over the internet himself, but all the same, it's like, dude, it's, it's just, you're trying to find people to play, you know, in this case, Pathfinder with, you know, you're not, you just, just put up a fire saying you're looking for some, for a group to join and, and just leave it at that. Yeah. You know? Yeah. You want to you take people like this under your wing and, and just kind of help them out. But. You know what are you what are you gonna do? I I know what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna I'm gonna make a flyer for the Geek Gab podcast, and I'm gonna make an adver- <laughs> I'm gonna make an advertisement for the Last Ancestor, right? Uh, and and I'm good. just gonna I'm gonna, like I'm, gonna, gonna I'm gonna tactically place these advertisements uh, so that they cover that that announcement and and see if anybody cares. Okay, I, that'd I be like where yeah. I like where your head's at. Yeah, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna get uh, we're gonna get people to buy this book. We're gonna get people to listen to the Geek Gab. I want it's gonna to be awesome. To Geek Gab. This is a great podcast. I think I've been listening to you guys since I first found you, which would have been 2017, 2016, something like that. Whole Daddy um, Warbig, have we really been doing this for that long? Uh, I, think I think it was we started early in twenty fifteen. Okay. Wow. <laughs> Someone so I, I said think more people should listen. <laughs> Brian said that we should start planning our 200th episode. And I'm like, dude, that's that's like four months away. <laughs> that's good. That's awesome. I'm like, I'm not going to plan something four months away. I, I don't even plan next week's episode. <laughs> You're a man after my own heart. You're a man after my own heart, Daddy. <laughs> and that's not good because I have uh, two kids, so I should probably be planning more. But I'm just like, am I going to get my son to school on time this morning that's that's planning enough for me all right so uh, every everybody takes their own has their own little take on on the pulps and and their you know which authors are important what style what's important about the style and the stories and everything like that so you wrote your book modeled off of uh john carter and uh the jack vance stories uh, what about those stories resonate with you? What What do you like about them? What's important about them? What did you and what did you carry over into your story? So it's not just the the writing style, which I, I like Jack Vance's style. I like how he's very he's economical, and I I think he's kind of elegant to tell you the truth in his in his economical way. And I actually like the Edgar Rice Burroughs more overwrought style. I don't try to ape either of those too much. What I like about the stories are that, especially, you know, I, I read A Princess of Mars the first time, I think about a year and a half ago, and it just blew me away. I was like, this, I can't believe one, this was written, you know, uh, what was that, hundred years ago. We're using a lot of these tropes now. And number two, I just love the, I love the action. I love the valor. I love that John Carter was just, you know, you don't see heroes like that anymore. John Carter didn't have this nagging self-doubt and navel gazing introspection am i doing the right thing he didn't have this existential angst the dude was a soldier he did what needed to do he fought he was brave he kicked ass and he took names but he was honorable about it and that that was just awesome um and one thing that resonated with me about burrows but also what, what i like when i read vance is just the, the they, they can just craft these alien worlds that don't seem to rely on standard sci-fi tropes. I don't, I mean, I, I hate, I, I obviously I haven't read every sci-fi book ever. I haven't read a fraction of a fraction of them, but you tend to see a lot of recycled tropes. All the aliens are kind of the same. All the, uh, the landscapes, this and that are the same. And I just like just the imagination that these two authors had. 50 years ago, 70 years ago, whenever they were writing. And I'm like, yeah, you know, just that to me is, is what a lot of rediscovering the old pulps and the old classics is about is realizing you don't have to have any kind of limit on your imagination. I mean, I, I my, my, the last ancestor has a race of dog men and it may seem kind of goofy, but I was like, you know what, why not? Why not have it? Why not turn man's best friend into a, uh, a very hostile alien race that does not like human beings wouldn't that be interesting why, why can't they ride giant lizard cats who the hell says they can uh and i like that freewheeling spirit of both because for example in uh, in the john carter stories you have many different types of martians 
and the green martians are just i mean they're bonkers right they're like these giant green things they got four arms and i don't know i love stuff like that and then um uh, god I'm, i can't believe i can't remember the name of the the john carter you know like the dog like creature not bula oh god what's that little alien companion he has that he kind of treats like his dog right with, yeah yeah with the five rows of teeth and that like i i love that that just uh, that killed me i'm like i love stuff like this so i just um, love that freewheeling aspect to go along with the you know the more traditional you know good versus evil heroics princesses and things like that i i realized last week after the big battle between some hard sf people in and, and jim it was all jim's fault <laughs> um <laughs> that there are there seem to be um a big divide between people who are writing stories and people who are writing counterfactual nonfiction. Um that is to say, they're creating nonfiction that just happens to have some unreal things in it, right? Like the Martian. It has, uh, it, it never happened, but if you accept that that character in that situation existed, it could have happened, so it's counterfactual nonfiction. And I've been playing with something, and one of the stories I'm playing with is that this city gets founded, and then four million years later, because of some stuff that happens, it has basically the same culture. And someone could say, well, don't you know that cultures grow and change, and, and don't you know that this and that? And I would say, yes, I, I actually do know that probably better than you, but I'm dealing in fantasy, and I don't mean the, you know, genre. I'm dealing in stories, in imagination, in fiction. I'm not dealing in reality or realism. That's not my stock in trade. Um... Yeah, that's a good distinction. I'm not trying to make a fictional world that is exactly like the real world, except it's counterfactual. Okay, here's magic, and now everything proceeds absolutely like it would as if it were real. That's not where legends come from. That's not what legends are. That's not where legendary stirring and moving fiction comes from. Epic stories, big stories, stirring stories have that aura of unreality about them. Um, and I, I guess I want to make an analogy here. Um, your boy Zach pointed out that if you go in and look at uh, comic books, good and great art isn't perfectly anatomically correct. Because in order to achieve the poses that make the most visual impact in the story, you have to cheat. You have to move an arm to a position that a real arm couldn't actually go to or turn a torso slightly too far, or whatever. Now, you should still know um, anatomy and things like that, but you want figures to do things that aren't strictly realistic, and that's what makes the fight scenes and the other uh, parts of the story have an impact. So... Strict realism is uh, has much, much less of an impact than slightly unrealistic drawings and poses. 
And it's the same with stories. Now, I'm not saying nobody should make counterfactual nonfiction. That's entirely up to you as an author. You can write what you want. But man, if you want to dig that gold, if you want to hit that pay dirt of moving your audience, of grabbing them by the heart, grabbing them uh, below their um, conscious mind, of giving them something that will thrill them and move them to tears, that will terrify them, that will make them, you know, thrill them. You have to do things that are larger than life and that are not realistic. If you want a 10,000-year-old galactic empire, for gosh sakes, throw it in there. Don't worry. I know because I've studied history and some other stuff for various things that it's unrealistic to have a galactic empire of 9 billion planets, each of which has a billion people. Impossible to govern that many people in an empire. It doesn't matter. Don't worry about it. Put it in there anyway because that is legendary. That is epic. That's what moves the audience are these iconic touchstones that make people excited, that get them involved. Right on. I mean, have you ever read The Iliad? That's, uh, people are still reading that and, uh, you know, read those fight scenes. They're not 100% down to the right technical detail, but, you know, you read that and you feel that, you know, you feel your own blood rush, you know, like you're there, right? And that's how many thousands of years old? Homer got it, you know, we should be able to get it too. I feel like it's your turn, John. Yeah, I was still lost in thought. <laughs> I, <laughs> normally, normally I'm quicker on, on, on the input here. Uh, but no, that, that really, that gave me a lot to think about. I, I think what I'm reminded of is when we talk to Brian Niemeyer, when he, when he gives out, he likes to give out writing advice. Uh, and he, he likes to remind us that books allow you to do things that you couldn't do in a film or, a, or even an animation that you are not constrained by the, by the, camera or the composition of the of your shot or even actors or anything like that you let the work do what it needs to do to evoke the images and the emotions that you're looking to evoke uh, without limitation and people uh, many people who are writing i guess what you would say is is bad or boring or uninteresting fiction they approach it as if they're writing a screenplay Yes. Or a yep. television show. Um, which uh, which is funny. Um, and I'm going to call out our, our, our previous guest, uh, who was uh, great. Uh, he actually is also a script writer. And so when he comes up with his ideas, he actually comes up with, you know, oh, I'd like to see this on a screen. Or, or sometimes my stories sound like a script. Uh, and I'm not saying that's bad, but what I'm saying is, if you want it, the the people who achieved the the great effects in storytelling like Homer and whatnot, they didn't approach it like they were trying to put it on stage. They they just wanted to tell. They just wanted to tell the story, and I think that's an artificial limitation. Uh, and so, if you approach it as you're writing a film, or oh man, I I really want this. I have this cool scene in my head. You know the. You know, the, my superhero picks up a car and throws it at the bad guy and, and so on and so forth. Yeah, you're going to write that. And, and it might be fun to watch that in a cartoon, but it's it's not what your focus is when you're actually writing fiction. Yeah, that's 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 a really good that's a really good point. Um, I remember Brian said something, too, 
fairly recently about how if you're focusing, you know, in, in, a, in a novel, say, or any type of prose story, you don't need to focus on, you know, you don't need to start with the setting right away. You're not framing the shot. Um, you know, you wouldn't want to start a book with, uh, you know, four paragraphs of what the landscape looks like. You know, you'd want to start with, you, you, you can get away in a book with starting with the action or starting with somebody's thoughts or starting with somebody's dialogue and all that setting stuff can be filled in later. And even just, I guess, to, to think about just, you know, flipping the paradigm, you know, that way, instead of having the scene drill down into what the character is doing, the action, the dialogue, you start with the dialogue, the action, what the character's thinking and extrapolate outwards. It really makes a huge difference. Um, I, I know you should see my first few novels unpublished that, and will stay that way that I wrote. And I was definitely approaching them like a, like a movie and it's just not as, you, let me put it to you this way. You end up with a lot of pages that you really could cut out. I'll leave it at that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fair way. Uh, you find yourself giving stage directions and, and whatnot yeah. and, and you go, oh, that's uh, another, and, and I've got to vent. I, I'm going to, I'm going to vent on this. Please. My, because my, the, I play a lot of Gloomhaven and it's a wonderful board game. But it's got sort of boxed text that sets up the scenario and describes, you know, there's a, there's sort of a loose narrative throughout the game uh, of, you know, a, some ancient evil. It's going to destroy the town, right? And, uh, but I've been railing against the writing every time we play. I can barely finish reading this text because it's written so poorly. And it's all... Uh, not only is it unnecessary dialogue, but it's also unnecessary stage direction and uh, and description stuff that stuff that either uh, doesn't need to be described or the worst part is uh, I don't know I don't know why this became so popular, but opening a simple uh, dialogue statement where uh, you begin with the quotes and and so and so says something. And then the there's a phrase that describes how they said it. Uh, I, I I know I'm being very vague right now, but uh, you know, I hope you're happy, comma she snorted, right? First of all, you don't need to say she she snorted. It should be clear from the context. And second of all, you've you're reading the description after you've already read the dialogue. So, so you either have to go back and, and reread that, especially if you're reading it out loud to your buddies at the table. Anyway, my point is, is that really bad fiction is rife with that sort of description. And uh, I, I have a tough time explaining to, you know, my, my buddies just think it's funny. They're like, yeah, this is, this is bad. But uh, it's, it's been difficult for me to describe exactly what's so terrible about it. They're like, you know, what's the big deal? It's just a fantasy story. I'm trying to explain. Yeah, okay. It's it's just a fantasy story. The tropes are there. Whatever. The narr I've got no problem with the narrative. It's the writing itself that is is just terrible, and and that's the reason why because it's all stage direction. It's all you know. I've got an idea of how this character would act, and so I'm going to write that in, and make it explicit, even though it really doesn't help the players at the table play the game. Yeah. Which which is which is the purpose of that text? It, it, it takes you out of the narrative, like you said. The narrative could be perfectly good, but that just it, it's like somebody screaming at you in your other ear. I'm writing. Yep, exactly. Uh, and and I'm pretty sure they could have reduced the uh, printed material in that game box by twenty five percent. <laughs> wow! Uh, by cutting by cutting that kind of garbage, they really do fill a lot of space with too too, too many adverbs. Really, yeah. So I I, I totally agree with you guys. Uh, in fact, if if I if I ever write anything like that, uh, a, a game, I mean, I'm gonna hire one of you guys <laughs> to do that, to do that actual uh, scripting. <laughs> Cool. It's just be careful and don't hire John because then half the text box are going to be, I am John De La Rose, the leading Hispanic <laughs> voice in science fiction. And you just don't need that in every text box. You really don't. 
I disagree, Daddy. I would one hundred percent play a tabletop game based on John De La Rose. Not his fiction, not the world he's created. I mean based on John De La Rose. <laughs> <laughs> I am so in. Yeah, all the all the all the pawns would, would be little dudes with baseball caps on, right? Yeah, for be playing the games everywhere. Yeah. It would be it would be awesome. You, you know, all the bad guys would be Yankees fans. All the good guys would be A's fans. It would it would be great. We we are unfortunately pretty close to running out of time. Oh, so we are. It's, it's been uh, it's been fun. Yeah, that's been fun. It's actually a perfect time because my daughter's been asleep about two hours, and she's probably going to wake up in about ten minutes. So, um, very <laughs> fortuitous. <laughs> Well, is, is there anything else that you want to talk about, Alex? Uh, anything you want to plug or anything you want to, any topic you want to broach before we call it? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, just a shout out to the Pulp Rub crew. Everybody's putting out good works. Um, if you haven't read Raul Nianzi's uh, Shining Tomorrow, I recommend that. That's a lot of fun. Uh, you know, Brad Walker's Star Night Saga, he, he, he kind of kicked off this whole, um, you know, muscular Christian, I shouldn't say muscular, yeah, muscular Christianity in sci fi. He, he has, you know, he did this Kickstarter and, or his crowdfund, and he raised the funds. He, he kicked it off. Um, it's good stuff. You know, Brian, I'm uh, I'm not a Mecha fan at all, and Brian Niemeyer's Combat Train Exceed made me actually care about Mecha. Uh, I'm missing a bunch of people. I, I haven't had time to read everybody's books, but there's just so much good stuff coming out now. I, I recommend, if you want to just hop on my Twitter feed, just follow the people I follow, check out their books if you're in the market for something new. A um, lot of good stuff. And then I want to give a special shout-out to my friend, Manuel Guzman, who did the art for The Last Ancestor. Great guy. Awesome artist. I think people are getting the book because of the cover and hopefully liking what's inside. And um, he's doing a, a Kickstarter himself for a fully painted storybook that I'm helping him edit the text for called In Search of Sacha. You can do an Indiegogo search for that. It's already hit its goal, but there's a stretch goal that we're trying to get going too. So uh, check that out. Um, you know, I always try to shill from my friends. So there you go. This has been a lot of fun, guys. I really appreciate it. Yeah, me likewise. Uh, it's it's good to have you on finally. Uh, talk to you, uh, and I I really liked Princess of Mars. Uh, so I I will probably give this uh, this this book a shot in the next two years. Next time I feel like actually reading. Hey, thank uh, that's, you. <laughs> yeah, that's a per, that's a personal joke. I I uh, Man, Manuel Guzman was his name. I absolutely love yep. this cover art. Yeah, he's he's uh, he goes by Lolo. His website's lolosart.com. He's a really cool guy, good artist, solid dude, family man, just a uh, good artist. And and you're getting lots of art from Ardenon. I've worked with him personally a couple of times. He's hanging out in the chat. Yeah, really really good stuff. Love work, working with oh, that guy. Ardenon's great. I, I I've met him in person. He's a cool dude. He's as cool in real life as he is uh, online. Not so anon. Got it. Not so anon, but uh, you know, my lips are sealed. I'm a lawyer. I know how to keep my mouth. Uh, I know how to keep secrets. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, well, uh, I'm I'm glad you came on. And special thanks to everybody uh, in the chat, including Ardenon DJ uh, and everybody else yes. chatting. Yep, uh, absolutely. Really, really appreciate it. Really good show, uh, everybody. Uh, and that's it. That's it for me, Daddy Warpig. Take us away. All right, I want to thank everybody who came in and listened live and uh, also everybody who tunes in later. Um, you can, of course, listen to the show on youtube.com slash geekgab, youtube.com slash geekgab. And for those of you who do not like listening to YouTube, you can catch us on the Google Play Store, on the Apple iTunes Store, and on soundcloud.com so you can... Uh, listen to us on the device of your choice. Just do a search for Geek Gab, and we are available in all those places. Uh, once again, a, a special thanks for uh, Alexander for coming on the show. Go check out his book, folks. Um, and uh, I, 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 I don't want to say this, man. I'm breaking into the uh, outro to do some shilling. I bought it, um, and so you should go and check it out, too. Um, I tell you this, but we are signing off for today, but don't you worry, don't you fret, we will be back.